Greetings from Tokyo, my dear, dear friends. This is Daisuke, and I very, very much hope that this video finds you well and in very, very good spirits wherever you are in the world. And today, if you don't mind, I would very much like to continue on with our journey, our discovery, our discussions, and our explorations with respect to the recent releases made by the Criterion Collection during this year of 2022. That brings us to that title, which has been designated by Criterion, at spine number 1131. This is a work which is from 1972, and the name of the filmmaker is John Waters. And the name of the work is Pink Flamingos. Kind, unforgettable work from 1972 from the extraordinary one, one of a kind unforgettable filmmaker John Waters and indeed it has an extraordinary unforgettable one of a kind cast of characters does it not portrayed by for example people like Mary Vivian Pierce and Mink Stoll and David Lockery and Danny Mills and Edith Massey and Cookie Muller and of course, of course, the one, the only, the legend that is divine as Babs Johnson. Wow, what a performance, a performance for the ages, in fact, in this work, which is Pink Flamingos. My goodness, Pink Flamingos is back in the Criterion Collection. I will speak a little bit more about that as we get into this video discussion. But first, my dear friends, let us try to focus in on the plot or story structure of Pink Flamingos. What is this film about uh, in terms of its plot or its story? I think one can tr uh, attempt to describe it as being focusing in on this core group of characters who live in this in this very uh, intriguingly set up trailer uh, out in the woods, and uh, this is a core group of characters who are Cotton and uh, Crackers and Mama Edie. So these are Danny Mills' character, Mary Vivian Pierce character, and Edith Massey character. And Edith Massey's character, for example, has a very uh, intriguing obsession with eggs. And also we have the very uh, intriguing and uh, oftentimes uh, quite mysterious and indeed perplexing even relationship between and among these characters. For example, the relationship between Cotton and crackers, and of course, uh, lest I forget, right, the one, the only character who is in many ways the central character in this close-knit circle, that is the character of Divine Babs Johnson, uh, under many, uh, an alias, of course, uh, but here we have Babs Johnson, the one, the only Babs Johnson, and the moniker, the title, uh, filthiest people alive, the filthiest person alive, and indeed they and uh, divine they wear this, uh, uh, they wear this branding with a sense of honor, with a sense of pride, and with a sense of no shame, no regret, and in that way they express themselves thoroughly uh, and uh, with a great sense of of uh, aggressive. Uh, uh, aggressive type of uh, individual spirit that is no holds barred in many, many ways. And so this is in many ways a type of setup of the character constructions that we have here. And the, and as, as I was hinting at earlier, the very intriguing nature uh, and even uh, in a kind of perplexing and quite challenging and, and, prov and provocative way how these relationships seem to be shifting uh, in terms of of uh, a play on, say, humor, a play on vulgarity, a play on a sense of horror and disgust and camp, but it's all done for the sake of telling the story or creating this world or creating the, the what might be said to be the construct of filth. And it's the construct of filth is done in a way that is, as I say, uh, entertaining uh, to many degrees. 
uh, it is entertaining to many degrees because we know that uh, the performances here are over the top. They are, as I say, no holds barred, over the top with situations that are just absurd, comic, wild, mind-blowing, out of this world even. And the more one watches, the more one uh, is absorbed in the world and then repulsed by the world at the same time. But this is part of the function. I would say of a work like Pink Flamingos. It is meant to challenge, it is meant to shock, and it, yes, it is meant to entertain and is meant to poke fun. It's meant to be a parody, it's meant to be an homage, it's meant to be a sort of love letter to all these uh, signals and signifiers of Hollywood, 1950s cinema and music and rock and roll and rockabilly and the like, and uh, Jane Mansfield and Marilyn Monroe and Little Richard and all the thing, Godzilla and all these, uh, uh, everything in between, and also a type of reflection of American culture or American subculture heading into from the late 1960s into the early 1970s. And indeed, John Waters does mention this too in the commentary tracks, or both commentary tracks, because there are two of them with John Waters that are included with this Criterion release, uh, and talking about uh, the hippie culture, hippie subculture, that was at at once uh, f uh, very much a fan of this work, Pink Flamingos, but also repulsed by this film, Pink Flamingos. And I think that type of... of complex reaction is one of the reasons why this film is so uh, so great and it's so absorbing and it's so uh, shocking and it's so in one's face it is truly uh, uh, it's truly a one of a kind uh, a, a camp masterpiece uh, bar none now I've uh, only mentioned part of the story, of course, in terms of Babs Johnson and uh, the circle and the filthiest person alive and the filthiest people alive. But that's not all, of course, because we have in this film, Pink Flamingos, the construction of competition. And in many ways, a type of deadly competition, a sort of uh, fight to the finish, uh, almost a, a survival of the fittest, an exercise uh, in extreme poor taste, as it will, in, uh, as, it, as one uh, states it in the context of uh, the John Waters cinema and the and the embodiment, if you will, of, of the American dream and capitalism here portrayed by the rivalry, the battle uh, between Babs Johnson and company on the one hand and Connie and Raymond Marble on the other, uh, David Lockery and Ming Stoll character. And so we have here a competition of who will be uh, who will be on top in this competition of, of vying for the, the title of the filthiest people alive. And here we have the story of Connie and Raymond Marvel, who have their own uh, uh, underbelly, seedy side businesses uh, that seem to be uh, uh, below the belt, uh, beyond the reach of the law, and very suspect, very much also uh, exercises in uh, 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 filth and very bad taste and indeed quite offensive in a lot of ways. And this is, again, part of the construction of their story too. It is meant to shock. It is meant to uh, be very repulsive. And it's meant also to use that as a means of defining what is the art of this work, Pink Flamingos. And so their traits, uh, the Con uh, Connie and Raymond Marble's traits, and then believe me, there are a lot of traits that are quite, quite something indeed. And when you see them on screen, my goodness, this is, uh, this is uh, 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 a shock to the senses in many ways. So we have that aspect of the film, and then you have on the other side, Babs Johnson, Divine, um, uh, Cotton and Crackers and, and Edith Massey uh, and the Eggman and all this thing uh, and the birthday party and all the gathering of, of the, uh, the locals and the local celebrities and the like. But at the same time, there's a sinister underbelly. There's a sinister uh, vibe in the air about uh, this uh, competition that grows in intensity as the film progresses, uh, level upon level upon level upon level until it reaches a kind of breaking point and when the breaking point reaches oh my goodness stand back hold on to something because you are in for an unforgettable uh, ride through John Waters cinema indeed and uh, the film provides some very very unforgettable images it provides some very unforgettable uh, moments in cinema, very shocking moments in cinema, very disgusting moments in cinema, and that is uh, th that is part of the reason why 
uh, I find it so, so uh, alluring. And so uh, uh, it's one of these things where I turn it on and I cannot look away. I am captivated by the sounds. I am just, I am repulsed by what I see. And I am uh, amazed by the way in which it guides me through this world, through the use of humor, through the use of a type of earnest endeavor at presenting these characters and who they are. And indeed, indeed, there are some very tender moments, too, uh, in the uh, course of Pink Flamingos. Uh, for instance, John Waters mentions in one of the comment or both commentary tracks, I should say, he mentions and there's a very tender scene. I mentioned Edith Massey and uh, uh, the Eggman, and there there's a moment of intimacy. And John Waters had mentioned how uh, in uh, theater, uh, in theaters, people would react kind of mockingly uh, towards the scene uh, because maybe of the way that Edith Massey looked in that particular moment or something. But John Waters uh, took offense to that and he said that uh, he thought that this was a very tender moment. And I think that's a great example of how John Waters uses concepts of camp uses concepts of societal norms and, and societal mores, things that are quote-unquote traditionally acceptable and traditionally non-acceptable. He uses that and turns them on their heads and throws it up against the wall, the cinematic wall, again, in your face, very no holds barred, but it's done in a way to shock and provoke. But there is, I think, a great value there is a great value in feeling shocked. There is a great value, I think, in feeling repulsed. I certainly feel that way. And I also see that there are many levels to this. It is uh, not meant to be purely on a, let's say, uh, exploitation level. There is also uh, something to be said here about the subversive nature of the images that we see how they seem to be recalling other things, how they seem to be uh, almost in a way reactionary to a lot of this uh, uh, so-called quote-unquote acceptable norms of society. And that is also uh, on a socio-political level too. I mean, in many ways, a lot of the scenes in terms of the counterculture or the counter-counterculture, even the counter-counter-counterculture, or even going one level for the counter-counter-counter-countercultural aspects of Pink Flamingos, I think goes uh, towards the very heart of this, which also speaks to uh, the way in which I think John Waters and company view uh, the role of individuality versus uh, external forces that put pressure on people to act in a certain way that may be oftentimes against what people might feel in terms of an individual spirit. And in that way, there is a really uh, liberating uh, aspect of watching a film like Pink Flamingos. Pink Flamingos is certainly not a film for everyone. Uh, I think uh, this is a film that, again, if you are uh, maybe not so comfortable with this type of, of uh, maybe disgusting or uh, uh, situations that suggest something of a very disgusting nature, uh, oftentimes, or uh, in terms of the very sort of iconic or intense or very famous or infamous scenes, uh, then maybe this film isn't for you. Uh, and that's okay. That's There's no problem with that at all. I mean, the, this film is not designed to be for every single person. However, there is uh, so much value in this work, Pink Flamingos. There is a sense of a, a kind of... Um, there's a sense of a reasoning, there's a sense of, of a type of horror, and there's a sense of a, a feeling repulsed and a kind of a abhorrent nature. And there are also moments of, of true shock. I mean, one, one sees it. There are some uh, kind of scenes of cruelty and violence that I think are, are quite, quite upsetting. Now, John Waters, in the commentary track, too, he makes a point in some of these scenes to, to be very upfront about the reasons behind his choice of doing what it is he does in certain scenes and the choices that he made in terms of what he shows, what he doesn't show. Uh, and so there is, uh, I think, the, the commentary tracks and the Criterion you know, release here really go a long way in also providing a great deal of context, a great deal of understanding, and also a platform for further uh, discovery and further um, uh, exploration of Pink Flamingos and indeed other works by John Waters. And so uh, there, is, uh, uh, there is a grand and a great design here at the heart of this film. It's been described, I think, with great pride, I should say, with great pride and with a great sense of, of no shame 
there is a sense of this film being a type of embodiment or capturing in cinematic form a type of disgusting filth and there is uh, the way in which this film is described as being uh, uh, very almost uh, raw and very uh, very almost inflammatory uh, and also very uh, insulting and uh, sometimes the words uh, that have been used are uh, you know uh, venturing into territories of, of obscenity etc etc but there is also the way in which that type of embodiment of those elements is also the function of uh, art and great art. And if one defines great art as being the uh, ability by which some kind of work of art can uh, produce or create or engender a reaction out of the observer of such work of art, then I think Pink Flamingo succeeds with flying colors uh, to achieve that level of, say, uh, uh, the encapsulation of what one might call great art. It certainly creates a reaction, that's for sure. And also, also one must uh, emphasize, too, uh, the fact that this is also, in many ways, a comedy. This is also uh, setting up scenes that are so over the top that you laugh out loud, and the lines and the dialogue and the way it's shot, uh, it's all designed in a way to be almost poking fun at itself, as well as providing grounds and room for the, the audience to laugh at the film and with the film. And uh, kudos to John Waters and company for creating a film that is not scared at all. It's not uh, shy from the fact of being the uh, subject of people laughing at the film, making fun of the film. That is one of the great strengths, actually, of John Waters as an artist. He is able not just to withstand that type of scrutiny, but also embrace it in a way and uh, shout from the rooftops, yes, this is one aspect of my art. Uh, uh, everyone who uh, might venture to see it, you know, uh, uh, if you get some kind of thrill or enjoyment out of it, even if it's at the expense of the film itself, I think that is alone worth the price of admission. And that is a grand achievement in and of itself. And I, in that way, and in many other ways, I admire John Waters as an artist. I am a big fan of John Waters works. You know, when I first saw this film, uh, upon the 25th anniversary uh, release or re-release back in the, the 90s for the first time. I had heard something about it, but I had never seen it prior to then. But then when I saw it, I was so shocked and appalled and disgusted. And I didn't know how to process it. I had no idea how to process it. And still to this day, after seeing it many, many, many years later, you know, regularly, uh, I still have uh, 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 the inability to process everything that I'm watching. But now I see the film as uh, using those elements that are engendered or built up within me, the, the levels of horror, disgust, and, and repulsion. But that is, again, a, a kind of inherent reaction. And having these reactions alongside these notions of homage and parody and uh, making references to, uh, uh, say, pop cultural society and uh, Americana and cinema and music and the like. Um, this is uh, the reason why a work like Pink Flamingo stands the test of time. I mean, it always creates a reaction and it always shows that the people behind the camera, the people that are creating this, are thinking. They are thinking, they are thinking, they are thinking. They are oftentimes many steps uh, beyond in terms of of what it is they're trying to show. And indeed, uh, they are not trying to uh, create something that is a, a, a sort of, uh, uh, it, it's, it's showing off in a manner of speaking. And it's also very humble. It is also very much uh, a work that feels handmade. It feels very much homegrown. Uh, this is the idea of, of the, the wonder of the home ground, you know, Baltimore home ground. And that is another great charming point of this work. And finally, uh, among other things, we have the charming aspects, you know, dreamland and uh, the, the great players that we see in this and other John Waters works. I mentioned the cast, uh, for example, Ming Stoll, Mary Vivian Pierce, David Lockery, uh, Edith Massey and others. Uh, they give 
give their own unique sense of individuality and style and uh, charm and energy. And my goodness, you see this band of people together and there is this uh, there's a sense of magic in the air. It's, a, it's this one-of-a-kind uh, pop art spectacle of, of, uh, of uh, uh, camp genius uh, that reaches heights that are almost like transcend time and space in a manner of speaking. And at the very heart and soul of that type of exploration is, of course, divine. Divine is a legend. Divine is a legend, and in many ways, perhaps, this role by Divine here is the ultimate expression of that legend of Divine. This is, in many ways, uh, one of the great roles ever. I mean, you can see how much Divine is really devoting to this role. I mean, there are some scenes that I'm not sure if, uh, if any other actor or performer would go that far. Uh, and so this is another testament to the the great acting really the great acting of divine and how far divine is willing to go for uh, the art for the art form for cinema and my goodness my goodness you know at first i didn't quite realize that when i first saw the film but as i was watching and watching and realizing uh the performance spectacle nature of this and i was realizing all oh, these people are performing these people are are performing in front of the camera and that includes divine and going that far doing that wow doing that and that will be embodied in cinema forever wow mind blown uh but yes this is a, a great example of the legend of divine uh i am a huge huge fan of pink flamingos again i acknowledge that this is a film not for everyone that is okay but for me yes uh, I have grown not just to love it, but to really love it. Uh, filth and all, uh, repulsion and all, uh, uh, bad taste and all, because there are also laughs to be had. There's also tenderness to be had. There's also uh, a great sense of, of context and explanation also to be had as well. And that's one of the great strengths of the Criterion release, uh, and the fact that it also gives room for exploration for this fascinating fascinating work from 1972 this is john waters work that is pink flamingos the criterion collection has released this work pink flamingos on this great new blu-ray uh, edition uh, at spine number 1131 uh, and uh, it is purported based on, to be based excuse me on a new 4k digital restoration at 1.66 to 1. And uh, to uh, look at the, uh, I took the liberty of removing the uh, insert and other uh, paraphernalia that's included, including the barf bag, which is included as part of the uh, Criterion Package. And I'll get to that momentarily. Uh, but here we have the insert, which is in the shape of this, uh, this um, uh, midnight uh, and if you know the film, you, you can recognize where this appears somewhat early in the film. This is really great. Uh, and I'll talk about the contents uh, a little bit later. But it also has on the back uh, the about the transfer section. And I quote, Pink Flamingos is presented in director John Waters' preferred aspect ratio of 1.66 to 1. Unlike original elements for some of Waters' other early films, which were stored in a state-of-the-art climate-controlled vault by Warner Brothers, uh, the 16mm ectochrome positive scan for this release was kept in his attic for the past five decades, and it is the same film that Waters originally hot-spliced and edited to make the movie. Oh, that's great. And then to continue on, the original monaural soundtrack was remastered from the 16mm magnetic track in the 25th anniversary edition soundtrack. So uh, we have the, uh, the presentation here, and one should note also that now it's 2022. This was released in 1972, and we had the, 25, the 25th anniversary release uh, in 97. So now we have 50 years after the initial release. So that is uh, a testament to the, um, the uh, sort of sustainability and the longevity of a work like Pink Flamingos. Wow, 50 years since its initial release. Uh, the world has not been the same since. Uh, and uh, uh, wow, indeed, this is a great release indeed. Now, I should say that the look and feel 
of this work, Pink Flamingos, un under this release from Criterion, you know, this 4K restoration, is amazing. It is amazing. Um, I was so fortunate to have had Pink Flamingos on a VHS tape. I don't have that VHS tape anymore, unfortunately. Uh, but in lieu of that, I was uh, so fortunate to get, for example, the, the Criterion Laserdisc, which is the 25th anniversary edition. Uh, what a great Laserdisc this is. It's spine number 341 in the Laserdisc catalog, uh, which has the, uh, the, the, the one of the commentary tracks that's included as part of this, uh, the first one. And then I also have the, the DVD here, uh, which is, uh, uh, which is um, has uh, another commentary track from John Waters. Uh, and so it's uh, wonderful to have these uh, selections here. But uh, I must say that uh, the look and feel of this Criterion release is, dare I say it, divine. Simply put, it is divine. Uh, there is, it, it feels still very grainy, and that's a great thing. There's a, the, the music pops, and it, 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 it's uh, sparkling, and that's a great thing. It was always meant to do that. There's a, this great way in which there's a type of separation between image and sound and the soundtrack uh, music. But that, I think, augments. That's a, uh, an interesting, almost nuanced style of the early John Waters works. And that is, in my ears, uh, it, it really helps to uh, hallmark and to uh, emphasize uh, the, the great, almost uh, pop pastiche artificiality of the uh, the application of the music, which is a great thing, by the way. It's an absolutely great thing because it, it identifies songs that are used to uh, be a type of Greek chorus to the scenes that we see uh, uh, unfolding before our very eyes, while also, in a way, almost poking fun and uh, being a type of parody uh, at the same time. And so that is a great nuanced, complex nature of the works of John Waters, especially during this early period. And you can take, for example, songs like The Way That the Girl Can't Help It is used, uh, and uh, the Divine, and uh, the legendary walks uh, down the street, and uh, the American flag, and people standing and staring in shock and, and awe and horror at this figure that is approaching them that is divine and all this and then also uh, another maybe very memorable use of music in a very very memorable scene uh, surfing bird so for anyone who knows uh, the scene that I'm talking about during the birthday party yes it is one of the most uh, 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 unforgettable uh, images uh, in cinema one one sees it one cannot unsee it and that sort of thing and you have the the music that is forever accompanying uh, that type of uh, conjuring up of the memory of that image so uh, those I think are examples of the brilliance of the soundtrack applied to this the image and indeed that is upheld faithfully and with a great sense of pride and fidelity in this uh, in this presentation. I am so overjoyed with this. I think it is a great, great presentation release uh, of, a, of this uh, memorable one-of-a-kind film. So uh, bravo, kudos uh, to uh, the Criterion Collection and crew uh, for being able to put this together like this. Incidentally, too, I should point out that unlike past releases of the film, at the very end of this particular version, there's also a, a, an end credits roll that has the a list of all the tracks, the musical tracks, and again, my recollection, it, it, it didn't, it, that kind of end credits rule wasn't included in any prior release. So that is a very interesting thing indeed as well. So a uh, type of acknowledgement or maybe rights clearances or something I'm speculating here. But in any event, uh, the uh, this is a presentation to hold on to, and this is a key one. So uh, well done for being able to do this. And again, uh, the 50th year anniversary to boot. So uh, great job all around. And now let us talk about the wonderful supplements that are included with this release of Pink Flamingos. There are so many, so many here. And so what are they? Let's first talk about the commentary tracks, plural because there is not just one, there are two. And each of them is with John Waters. So if one is described as being from 97, and the other is being from uh, early 2000s, around 2001. They are great. Um, I love the commentary tracks by John Waters. Anytime there is an opportunity to watch a John Waters film with a commentary track, I'm there. I have a number of his films uh, on uh, physical media that have John Waters commentary tracks and I am always just laughing out loud, thoroughly, thoroughly entertained. The way that John Waters speaks and the 
he's just so much he's so uh, uh, well spoken and funny and erudite and so so intelligent and just within the space of say I don't know 10 or 15 seconds he just uh, states all these references to history pop culture and it's just it's uh, like a it feels like running a marathon trying to keep up with him it's amazing absolutely amazing the depth of knowledge that he has and to be able to express it in such a funny witty clever way every single time uh it's amazing it's amazing so you get not just one john waters commentary track but two Great. So uh, the first commentary track, uh, he talks uh, very. Uh, he talks about the title, Pink Flamingos. He talks about what he calls filth music, B-side music. He talks about terrorism. Makes references to uh, Charles Manson uh, and uh, uh, politically correct versus politically incorrect. You know, hippie culture and uh, the the uh, the idea too of, of there's a type of nuance political statement or set of statements that is also being made as well. Divine is also mentioned, of course, Ming Stoll, Danny Mills. Danny Mills is uh, mentioned here, but maybe uh, he had some misgivings after the fact and not really wanted to be associated with the film afterwards, but he really had a very, very, very unforgettable presence here as Crackers in a lot of scenes that are, uh, wow, uh, uh, wow, just over the top shocking uh, and uh, and even John Waters might uh, discusses how maybe he might have gone too far with some of the scenes uh, that are involved here. So, for example, some of the scenes that Crackers is involved in, uh, Crackers and, and Babs Johnson a little bit later on in terms of, uh, of uh, talking about a, uh, uh, a porno chic on um, this type of, of uh, uh, the, the pornography films that were uh, becoming very much in chic at the time uh, during the early 1970s and how there was a certain scene a little bit later in the film between Divine and, uh, and uh, Babs Johnson and, and Crackers, uh, which John Waters in the commentary track is saying it's, it's, uh, it's meant to be a type of uh, riff or a type of um, parody on this genre or subgenre of uh, pornography in the quote-unquote mainstream uh, and how that that reference is lost uh, perhaps on today's movie going audiences because uh, that notion of the early 1970s and the emergence of uh, sort of the the mainstream popularity of pornography uh, was something that was really key in, in one of that those key sequences in the uh, the marble household you know uh, so uh, that's one aspect there's also a very famous or infamous uh, and quite disgusting scene uh, involving uh, chickens uh, in this film. And so uh, John Waters does mention uh, what he describes, not necessarily a justification of the scene per se, because it is quite a shocking and maybe to some people, uh, maybe an unforgivable uh, scene indeed in the film. However, he does make the point here and also in the 25th anniversary bonus footage uh, section, he does make the point about, about uh, you know, the, the idea of cruelty uh, to animals, but also the idea of of uh, uh, what is it? What what is the sense of of cruelty against the context of say uh, sort of uh, uh, meat eating and uh, sort of uh, the meat packaging industry writ large? And so whether one agrees with that or not, I mean it, it, the explanation is there, uh, and this could be. Uh, type of make or break scene for a number of people uh, in terms of whether they find Pink Flamingo's uh, type of maybe uh, acceptable as a form of say cinematic entertainment, uh, warts and all, uh, even with misgivings, or perhaps if a film like uh, Pink Flamingo's with this sort of scene goes too far. Uh, so again, uh, uh, one is free to feel and one is free to react the way one does uh, in in uh, watching uh, a film like this with certain sequences like this. But in any event, the commentary track does make point of that, again, from John Waters' perspective. He does talk, too, about the construction of the look of Divine here, uh, the, the the way in which the hairline was, uh, was adjusted in order to make room for the over-the-top large eye makeup uh, and the the dress look and the and the such so so there is a real transformation even within the look of divine say from uh, from the look of divine uh, say in Mondo Trasho before to now and therefore divine uh, divine has arrived in a manner of speaking 
so there's that. And then also other uh, uh, people mentioned here, uh, Edith Massey, of course, Kirill, Mary Vivian Pierce, of course, Kirill, Ming Stoll I mentioned too. Uh, there's a lot of references made to uh, the phrase cheaters uh, and also uh, the coloring of the hair and David Lockery and what he had to do in terms of stripping the original color out of the hair and then uh, using uh, dye or using magic marker to color. And there's an interesting thing here in this commentary track, John Waters describes David Lockery as having used dye to color his hair blue and then Ming Stoll using magic marker to color her hair red. However, in the Divine Trash documentary, Ming Stoll mentions the opposite. And indeed, in the later, the second commentary track, John Waters describes it in the opposite way. He describes it there, and Ming Stoll describes it in the, in the Divine Trash documentary as Ming Stoll having used red dye to color her hair red, whereas David Locker is coloring uh, his hair using, I think, magic marker or something like that. I'm not sure exactly what the details are, but in any event, the look and color of the hair uh, uh, for Connie and Raven Marble, this is also very important as well. Cookie Muller is, is mentioned too because she has a, a relatively speaking small role but a very significant role uh, in this film uh, and the like and so uh, uh, John Waters mentions uh, it, it's like uh, Janis Joplin meets Charo which is uh, again John, uh, John Waters has such a way about descriptions it's, a, it's really amazing. He talks about Cadillacs, he talks about um, uh, uh, he talks about some really some sort of shocking scenes. Maybe he wouldn't have included them had he made the film now. Uh, in terms of say some of the the, uh, the the side business of Connie and Raymond Marble and all that really unpleasant stuff that is involved with that. Uh, and uh, there's a uh, uh, there's uh, like references to uh, like yoga exercises and uh, A200 and uh, sort of venereal disease uh, medication and uh, sh having the, the film was shown in prison um, and also uh, the idea of ratings and censorship and ratings board uh, and uh, the, the, the what happened after the film was released and the sort of midnight film uh, trend that it was a part of a really indelible part of that and other works like El Topo and others and also there's <laughs> there's this comment about how he could imagine uh, if they made the film you know uh, again you know uh, t uh, contemporary to the, the commentary track here late 90s uh, who would play uh, the role of Divine Anthony Hopkins <laughs> would play Divine which is wow wow it's it's again it's uh, mind blown. Uh, mo many points in this commentary track, mind blown. I love this commentary track so much, uh, very, very much indeed. So that's the first commentary track. The second commentary track is also with John Waters. Now he goes over some similar points, uh, but he expresses them somewhat differently. And again, there is that same charm, that same wit, that same, uh, 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 he's on his toes with all these pop cultural references and historical references. It's amazing. He talks about the credits. He talks about uh, his parents seeing it or not seeing the film, uh, being an answer on Jeopardy, uh, terrorism and hippie culture he's talking about, uh, how people thought that this was actually a real thing that was going on he talks about other people in the in the core group you know dreamland of pat moran and, and her mother uh the sequence involving shopping girl can't help it uh some of the uh, details in the background like the posters on the wall teorema and the like the word filth as well he talks about that night games is, is referenced uh uh and uh talks to about david lockery having a really uh a big influence on uh the look of divine as well um i should mention too uh that the uh, credits you know van smith as credited for Divine's makeup and costume. So Van Smith had a real key role in the creation of the look of Divine, as well as David Locker, as well as Divine. Uh, so, uh, and then Divine was uh, almost designed in a way to scare other drag queens. Uh, uh, and also mention is made about Little Richard and and uh, uh, stories about Little Richard in the context of a particular scene in this film about a uh, something that is sent in the mail from one character to the other in a parcel or in a package. So. Uh, yeah, just, again, just mind continuing to be blown. It's just like fireworks going off here. It's, it's really, and then there's some uh, sequences that uh, recall Night of the Living Dead, the birthday party sequence, uh, and uh, some mentioning about uh, Channing. And, and uh, so, yes, you're getting a lot. You're getting a lot with these commentary tracks. And so bravo to Criterion for being able to include both of them. 
Uh, I'm really glad that they're there. If I had to choose, again, I'd love both of them, but maybe my heart might tend 60%, 40%, slightly towards the first commentary track over the second commentary track. I don't know, there's a there's a type of... of uh, he he seems so like laughing and excited in the first commentary track and and then second commentary track. There's there's still the same level of excitement, but there's also a a, a almost a type of of a, of a calmness as well. So uh, it's your preference, your call. I might tend towards the first, but I still love the second one. Uh, but in any event, you have your choice of two or both, as the case may be. So please check out the film if you can uh, with one or the other or both commentary tracks. Again, in your uh, in uh, in in your own good timing, my dear friends. And now going forward with the actual supplements as well, beyond the commentary tracks, because we have a number of supplements that are really great here. First up, we have the one hour, 37 minute or so documentary, the Steve Yeager documentary from 1998, which is Divine Trash. Now we had some excerpts of Divine Trash from the earlier uh, Pink Flamingo's Criterion Collection Laserdisc, but here we have the full deal, uh, and it hadn't been included in any other release of Pink Flamingo's since then until the Criterion Collection release here, and this is fantastic. If you want an introduction into the world of John Waters, if you want an introduction into the inspiration and career of John Waters, the, the references, the, the, the filmmakers that uh, uh, were also part of that same world or similar world, experimental art house uh, filmmaking, uh, uh, sort of independent filmmaking uh, to the max, uh, as well as how that led into uh, the steps along the career of John Waters leading up to films like Mondo Trasho and then Pink Flamingos. There is a great emphasis in this work on Pink Flamingos, by the way. Uh, this is the place to go. This is such a great one, Divine Trash. Um, uh, other filmmakers are mentioned to Herschel Gordon Lewis, uh, Kenneth Anger, uh, Ken Jacobs, etc. And then um, I mentioned to about uh, other early works, uh, Roman Candles, Hag in a Black, black Leather Jacket, uh, Eat Your Makeup, etc. And also how a lot of people uh, were very much supportive of John Waters in the community, uh, in, uh, including uh, having uh, one of his short films being shown in a local church uh, with the blessing of, uh, of the people there, and also uh, the critics and how people started to hear of John Waters through word of mouth, etc. And then meeting Divine, meeting uh, Mary Vivian Pierce, and meeting uh, Ming Stoll and everyone. Uh, and so, and, and uh, how this became uh, part of and an uh, integral part of the legend that is uh, Dreamland. And so, uh, uh, leading into works like Multiple Maniacs, now, uh, uh, Mondo Trash of Multiple Maniacs, and the like. And so, uh, this is great. Incidentally, uh, I probably, I'm not sure if it'll ever happen, but uh, if, if one day, if it could be possible, if Mondo Trasho uh, could get a release, uh, you know, a Blu-ray or something by Criterion or uh, something with the powers that be, if that ever were possible, wow, 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 wow. Uh, I've heard that maybe it might not be possible due to rights issue. Again, I'm not sure uh, what the case is at all, but Ma uh, Mondo Trasho, I, I have the, the VHS tape, the sort of official VHS tape of it, uh, which has now, of course, fallen out of print, unfortunately. But uh, if, if my, my goodness, if the, uh, if the physical media gods uh, could answer my wish, it would be uh, for there to be a, a Criterion Collection Blu-ray release of, of uh, Mondo Trasho to go alongside the other Criterion releases of films like Multiple Maniacs, uh, Female Trouble, uh, Polyester, and now this Pink Flamingo. So... Uh, and then also other films, too, by John Waters, if they could be released, uh, would be great. Desperate Living, uh, which we have right here on the, on the shelf, uh, Desperate Living here. That would be a great one, as well as other maybe later works by John, uh, John Waters. Oh, my goodness, my goodness. But now we have Pink Flamingo, so this is a, a, great, a great cause for celebration. But now going back to more points from the Divine Trash documentary. Uh, the Look of Divine is mentioned here. Uh, uh, drag Queens is mentioned. Also, um, Divine, uh, considering... Uh, himself as an actor, as a performer. And this is also a very important statement, too, because, again, it, it's a reminder, too, of just the dedication to the craft uh, that Divine had when uh, performing uh, this role of Divine Babs Johnson 
in this work, Pink Flamingos. So, uh, and also there's mentioning too of the dialogue and the rehearsal process and the, the legend of Pink Flamingos, the, the, uh, the notoriety, the infamy of Pink Flamingos when it was released. That ending, the ending of Pink Flamingos. I mean, you're talking about en when one thinks of the great shocking endings of, uh, of works of cinema, Pink Flamingos is up there. I mean, Pink Flamingos, the way it ends in this type of almost uh, wink to the audience, and my goodness, what a wink and what a smile, what a grin that is by Divine at the very end. And it says, the end. <laughs> wow. Uh, again, just, uh, it's, it's like one of those moments that once you see it, you can never unsee it. And this work, Divine Trash, talks about the preparation, the, the leading up to it, what, had to, what was involved, and what the, the end result was, and, and what the, the legend or the fame or infamy of that scene is. So, again, uh, Divine Trash, Divine Trash. Please check it out if you haven't already. This is really, really wonderful. That's not all, because then we go into a 2022... Uh, criterion produced supplement here. This is approximately 30 minutes. This is a conversation between John Waters and Jim Jarmusch. Uh, this is so, so wonderful. Uh, Jim Jarmusch has such a great admiration and respect for John Waters and Pink Flamingos. They talk about the original release of this film uh, in March, I think, uh, Baltimore, 1972. And now, it, 2022, the 50th anniversary. It's now also, they also mentioned too, it's the 50th anniversary of The Godfather, the release of The Godfather. Uh, and so, uh, but uh, John Waters, I think, uh, very playfully, but also very much... Uh, 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 confidently makes the point that maybe there aren't that many differences actually between The Godfather and Pink Flamingos. And the more one thinks about it, the more I think there is room for that type of discussion. Well done, John Waters, for doing that, a type of, of gentle pushback, if you will, in this great conversation. Again, Jim Jarmusch has uh, such a great warmth and admiration for this filmmaker artist, John Waters, and it shows. Uh, there is uh, so much of a uh, of, uh, type of... Uh, there are so many elements that might be uh, looked down upon uh, that are part of this uh, film, uh, uh, but they are included here with great gusto, with great relish, and with great uh, energy and spirit and an independent streak that is undeniable, absolutely undeniable. And they talk to about the music. Uh, There's a mention too about Boise, Idaho and the boys of Boise. And uh, this is also playing into what happens maybe towards the end. And so there's, the reference is also described uh, in the, uh, the commentary tracks about Boise. Why Boise? Well, John Waters makes the explanation here. And so that's, that's great as well. There's also a very interesting uh, uh, discussion here about uh, pronouns, the use of pronouns and the discussion. And when one speaks of divine, uh, the pronouns and John Waters says, you know, uh, uh, yeah, when I use uh, when I say pronouns or when I use pronouns talking about divine, I, I use pronouns like he, him, uh, in terms of of, uh, of of the the pronoun usage. But then sometimes when I'm I'm thinking about the the performance of divine, the character. Uh, in uh, the films like Female Trouble or Pink Flamingos, then I, I, I might sometimes use uh, pronouns she or her. And so that's, that's the way it is, according to John Waters. And I really, I, I was very fascinated by that discussion, that point of discussion. It, it's very brief in this, uh, this 30-minute conversation, but that is, wow, again, uh, so, so pr like profound. And so, again, mind-blown continually, continuously. So well done to Criterion for this. This is a great conversation. John Waters, Jim Jarmusch, uh, and uh, brilliant stuff all around. So please check this out if you can. Uh, oh, they also speak to about writing and art and John Waters. They also speak about kitty flamingos uh, and the like. So uh, for those and other reasons, uh, please check out this one-on-one uh, -on -one conversation between these great artists uh, if you can. Approximately 30 minutes. And that's not all, because then we have another recently produced, it looks like a Criterion produced supplement from 2022. This is approximately 22 minutes. This is location, Baltimore. And here we have John Waters himself 
driving to uh, two specific locations here. The first location is the place where the trailer was, Bab Johnson's trailer was, where Babs and uh, Crackers and, and uh, Cotton and uh, uh, Edie uh, were living. Uh, and it was uh, the site of many, many a spectacle indeed in the film. Uh, but we have the location of the trailer, which is now a house with a large yard in the woods. And so John Waters goes to this house and visits the people who live there. And they try to find the spot using a, a metal detector where the trailer might have been. It's a, maybe there was some, something buried of the, of the former trailer there or something like that. And they talk about it. The people who live there uh, are having such a great time. They talk about watching the film, Punk Film Boomers, for the first time and being wow. And then uh, John Waters is such a, so charming, such a gentleman, so polite and so warm and also very funny and very welcoming as well. So uh, that is great indeed. And then uh, John Waters visits the, the home of Connie and Raymond Marble. And uh, this is also great too because he mentions here and also he mentions during the uh, the, the commentary directs how um, he and Ming Stoll would live in that house. And he says, you know, we were a couple, we were a couple, he said, but they would live in, in separate rooms, but that's where they lived. And the landlord let them use their Cadillac, which is featured in the film. It's, it's so many great things. And so now he's visiting the house once again, and he visits the, the young man who's living there. And he talks uh, to this young man and he sees his room. He says, it's still me. He, sees, he looks at his, uh, the guy's room and there's still a little bit of, a little bit of mess around. There's some clothes on the board. He just kind of makes a little joke about the, the messy room. And so I was just laughing out loud at that. And they go into the attic and there's uh, John Waters talks about how it wasn't he, but maybe a separate uh, production uh, filmed a, a pornographic movie in the attic, I think. And so uh, they go into the attic and the thing that John Waters says is, uh, oh, that's great. They didn't make it look suburban looking. <laughs> and so and because it looks like this attic and he sees that there's a, a, a table for gambling there and just, oh, it's, you look like you're having fun. So uh, just uh, my goodness. And they see the room and the banister and that the banister is very important too, because there is a very, very uh, famous or infamous scene involving uh, putting a curse on the marbles and what um, Crackers and Babs Johnson do when they break into the house, including the banister and how uh, someone who used to live in the house finally discovered what happened to the banister. That person was so shocked. <laughs> and so it's just it's like, like uh, so he sees the banister and the like. And so, uh, but the, 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 the young man who's living in the house is there. There's also a really interesting uh, other coincidence in connection between John Waters and this young, young man who lives there. And, and John Waters, says, wow, this is amazing. So uh, this is so, so, so great and the house doesn't look all that different that's amazing it's such a cool looking house and to be able to go in there and to see what it uh, how it it remains the same even after all these years what 50 odd years wow this is great so uh this uh, location baltimore uh, supplement from 2022 approximately 22 minutes uh please check it out if you can this is absolutely wonderful and that's not all because then we get the uh, 25th anniversary footage uh, which is uh, totaling 13 minutes, which also has at the very end of that the trailer. Um, and so uh, we have uh, the, uh, this is the outtakes with the John Waters introduction that you saw on previous releases as well. Uh, so uh, if, you, you, if you have other releases of Pink Flamingos, you, chances are you've already seen this. And so this is introduction to uh, kind of certain outtakes or different versions that didn't end up in the film. Uh, but it's a really uh, great thing to see. Now, I should point out one, uh, uh, if you haven't seen it, it's, it's classic, classic style. I should point out one thing, however, that what was great about the earlier DVD was that over this actual 25th anniversary bonus footage section was also the option of listening to John Waters giving a commentary track over the section which was so funny. <laughs> it was so great. And that's one of the reasons why I love this DVD release. Unfortunately, I couldn't find that option available uh, with the Criterion release. Maybe I, I didn't press the button correctly. I'm not sure. But I don't think that the option to listen to a commentary track over the 25th anniversary bonus footage section is uh, made available, which is a shame. I, I really enjoyed uh, listening to this here. And John Waters, he's is this a, are, are we really doing this? Are we really putting a commentary track over this footage? But anyway, those great times to be had by all. So, but uh, that doesn't take away from the actual footage itself. It's wonderful. It's funny. It's really strange. And wow, um, uh, great stuff. Yet other examples of 
of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the greatness that is Pink Flamingos. I think perhaps one of my favorites is the Pig Latin section. But uh, anyway, there's that section, which is totaling 13 minutes, which also has the trailer at the very end there. Um, and then you have, continuing on with the supplements, you have outtakes. And the outtakes is uh, 25 minutes now. The outtake section looks to me like the full outtakes that were used for the 25th anniversary bonus footage section. So you can actually see the beginning, middle, end, end of the, the, the excerpts that were part of that. So if you want to get the full picture of these full scenes, you can check out, take a look at the outtake section. So I was so excited to see this uh, when it occurred. So uh, well done for being able to do that, totaling 25 minutes. And then you also have the trailer at the end. And so you get the trailer twice uh first at the end of the 25th anniversary bonus section and then now as a separate supplement for the criterion release and now let us take a look at the packaging and the goodies that are included as part of this criterion collection release so first up let us look at this this is a plastic case but it's a plastic case in this uh in right with this outer covering right here and so we have here the slip cover uh, and you have the slip cover with this uh, uh, sort of paper uh, packaging motif, which is, I think, meant to uh, remind us of a particular moment involving packages and packages being sent in the mail, etc. So that is the motif here. So that's the slip cover uh, outer casing, and it's made of a type of thin cardboard. It's a really nice design. But then it reveals inside, which is right here. This is the plastic case. Uh, over which the slip cover will uh, go over. And uh, we have uh, here on the back here, it says John Waters uh, B 1946 Pink Flamingos, comma, 1972 60 millimeter ectochrome portrait of the filthiest person alive here. And look at that cover art design and you open it up and it has this right here. And the disc is meant to suggest a cake and this is, of course, uh, I think a reference to a sequence involving a cake and celebration in the film. And so this is a really, I think, ingenious design. I love it. And I love this portrait as well inside. Again, if you look very carefully, there are some details that might be suggesting, again, another very iconic, famous, infamous scene in the film. And not to mention, too, uh, the insert here. Uh, which is in the form of this tabloid uh, newspaper-like thing. And again, you saw a little bit of, of this image early on in the film uh, with uh, the great voiceover of John Waters as well uh, going into that. He do does talk, I mentioned, I forgot to mention in the commentary track about the inspiration for the voice uh, that John Waters uh, was doing when he was giving the voiceover narration in a lot of parts of Pink Flamingos. That's another great story as well. But... Here we have this, which includes a number of writings. First is Howard Hampton, The Battle of Filth. And this is, again, a great essay uh, included here with uh, the... Uh, uh, it's written into uh, the actual uh, uh, tabloid uh, newspaper motif as well. So this is uh, very good to uh, check out. And then also there is Cookie Muller's A Whole Other Kind of Film. And this is an excerpt from the book, uh, her book, uh, Walking Through Clear Water in a Pool Painted Black, published you know, posthumously in 1990. Uh, and this is a segment where she recalls the making of Pink Flamingos. So Cookie Muller, as I mentioned, is a very key aspect of the film, a uh, very key aspect of John Waters' dreamland and the landscape. So it's wonderful to have these writings uh, included in this great uh, concept art uh, packaging aspect. So wonderful, brilliant stuff indeed. I'm so glad it's it's uh, done this. I love things like this. So uh, in the paper, it's it's a thin type of paper. It's meant, I think, to uh, suggest the tabloid newspaper tape. So uh, it, you know, it's it, it it's a little bit maybe uh, sensitive or a little bit. Uh, uh, it's not the most robust piece of uh, paper material in the world, but that's okay because again, it's meant to suggest the tabloid newspaper like uh, situation there. So well done, Criterion, for being able to do this. And then I have to mention this, which is, uh, again, part of the paraphernalia of this release. Now, this appears to be a barf bag or maybe a mock-up of a barf bag. You know, so it's a little bit of a, you know, and it's actual bag. So it, it, it's lined on the inside. So I think it's actual, it has a practical use as well as being uh, a, a piece of paraphernalia as part of a physical media Blu-ray disc release of Pink Flamingo. So this is very interesting. Pink Flamingo. 
uh, I think is what it says here, Pink Flamingo Barf Bag. And I like the drawing of the flamingo there. I think that's really uh, quite clever. And there's a there's a look on the flamingo's face that's uh, very, very intriguing. I should say too that um, I think in in the course of my say physical media blu-ray dvd collecting i think i've come across only one other release that came with its own uh sick bag so this is i think the second release in uh, that i've ever come across that has its own sick bag it was very intri intriguing indeed i'm not sure uh, if uh, if I want to test out whether it has any actual practical utility or not, but I will keep it as a type of souvenir as part of this overall package. And again, I get the joke. I, I understand what uh, what this is meant to imply. But in any event, uh, that's part of the uh, that's part of the fun, as it were, the, of the little bits of uh, of uh, memorabilia and paraphernalia that uh, encompass great physical media releases from Criterion, such as the Pink, Pink Flamingos release. So. Uh, here we have it. This is, oh, I should point out too that the artwork, uh, the artwork is credited to uh, art directors Eric Skillman, Sir Habibi, illustration Jackson Northam. So uh, great stuff, great stuff indeed. Um, I didn't expect uh, the artwork to reveal uh, this underneath. I, I had only seen this sort of paper bag type of artwork design, which I still love. I think, it, it again, it serves the function of reminding me of, of a certain scene or certain scenes in the film, as well as the underlying portrait as well, as well as uh, this uh, uh, insert as well. So uh, great stuff. And well, as, and well too, we have uh, recalling back to the uh, the great days of Laserdiscs and the return of a Laserdisc title to the Criterion Collection catalog and a John Waters title to boot. So Pink Flamingos is back in the Criterion Collection catalog. Um, and uh, what a great, great, great thing it is. I think I mentioned it uh, in one video uh, talking about the reaction to the announcement. This is at spine number 1131. I wish that, oh gosh, if this had been released at spine number uh, 1134, that would have been really, really cool indeed because it reminds me of a joke or a reference that I think John Waters mentioned in a commentary track, I want to say was the commentary track early on to the film Pecker, where he talks about what he describes as a Catholic joke. Um, and so it would have been really cool if you had had 1134, because if you look here, I've written 1134 like this. If you turn it upside down, it spells hell. Uh, so it's not exactly the same sequence of numbers that John Waters mentions in the commentary track, I think, to the film Pecker or Cecil B. Demented, I forget exactly, but it's still, uh, it's still, uh, it's very similar. So if they had made it 1134, I think that would have been like icing on the cake or something, or, or cherry on top of the icing on the cake, or whatever metaphor image one wants to use. But in any event, 1131 is still fine for me. It is more than fine. It is divine. Uh, because we have, as I say, this being the spine number four, the great grand entrance, the great return of this back into the Criterion Collection catalog for all eternity. It is this film, which is Pink Flamingos. Okay, my dear friends, so that's it for now. And so until we meet again, please be happy and healthy and well. And please keep on watching a lot of great, great movies. Thank you so much, as always, for your time. I very, very much appreciate it. Stay strong, stay safe, and cheers. Mm -hmm.